come on Murray, the preliminary bouts were over. The referee, tall and white-haired, stood alone beneath the blazing ring lights, calling the contestants for the premier event of the night, which was in fact the event of the year, the district championship, the Golden Gloves, Gordon Carey at 10 stone 2, Marty McGann at 10 stone 1. The crowd from the Merry Wood in which they had barracked the slather and whack battles of the preliminary kids had fallen silent, serious, for there was a good deal more to this contest than was being declared by the referee. It might mean that this back blocks town would eventually have a state champion to brag of who might go on to win the Australian title, who might even establish the name of his hometown in the great world. But something more than this caused the crowd to become serious. What it was was revealed with the appearance of the contestants. First up through the ropes was a golden head and a torso gleaming white in the glare. Half the crowd clapped yelled, stamped, good on you, Gordon. Gordon Carey, a handsome boy, superbly built, raised a hand in unsmiling salute. Then the other half of the crowd, the dark mass in the gloom on the left side, let out an explosive yell at sight of a dark curly head and copper brown body popping up into the opposite corner of the ring. Marty, our boy Marty. Show em, Murray, Yacarel. Marty McGann turned his aboriginal grin on the whole house about him. There was a ripple of clapping for him from the white side. He was half cast. The fact that half the crowd were Murray's people of Aboriginal stock did not mean that the district was populated in like proportion, whereas it was simply the sporting section of the whites of the district who were represented. Pretty well the whole of the colored population were there, denizens of that slum on the outskirts of the town called Boongville, augmented by their brethren from the government mission and also by workers from the cattle stations for many miles round, that there was antagonism here between white and color would have been denied, just as in any other Australian town. Indeed, the denial would be well supported by the way these boys Carey and McGann, when called to the middle of the ring by the referee to show themselves and make their pact of fair dealing, gave each other a swift hug. Nevertheless, there was the existence of Boongville out of one of the hovels of which McGann had come this night. The best of six rounds cried the referee. The boys went to their respective corners, and the supporters there awaiting them. Marty McGann's second was a white man, or rather a red man. So rudely did his plump face glow. He was Tom Tasker, the publican, leading sportsman of the town. For the rest, his supporters were half-caste, like himself. One of them was his father, a huge, fat, wheezy man, with a hide like old saddle leather. Dong, round one, chanted the referee. The crowd went wild as the boys stepped out. Good on you, Gordon. Come on, Murray, Yacarel. There was nothing to that first round except to show the style of the contestants and the fact that they were well matched. Carey was a dancing man, forever on the go, advancing or retreating, menacing in his grim-faced eagerness. 
McGann used little footwork, seeming simply to glide, and yet to be exactly where he ought to be, effortless in every movement, grinning all the while. Let him parry and block and slip. It was a pretty exhibition, but hardly fighting. The crowd sat silent, waiting. Dong, the boys returned to corners. As Marty sank to his stool, Tasker, beginning to massage his dusky belly, said, Get into him, son. You got to start wearing him down. Get him swinging. You know, that's his weakness. Old McGann, flailing the towel, wheezed. You got to it him. Boy, you got a it him. Ard. Marty nodded, still grinning. Dong, round two. Carry came flying to the attack. He pressed it, left, right, left, right, jabbing and hooking. He got one in on Marty's jaw that made the white crowd roar and sent Marty staggering back, shaking his head for all the retention of the grin. Get after him, Carry. Get it back to him, Murray. Carey tossed a straight left. Marty Dot came up with an uppercut. Now the black crowd roared. Led and slip the counter. Dong. Back in the corner, Tasker said to Marty, You're not hitting hard enough, son. You let him get points on you that round. Dong. Round three. Out again to the dancing and the gliding, to the blocking and slipping and countering, lead and faint and hook. Carey was mixing it vigorously. Marty kept mainly on defensive, dodging, ducking. Carey jabbed viciously, right, left. Marty blocked most of it and kept on grinning through what he took. The whites roared. Into him, Carry, you're getting him. The Murrays screamed. Hit him, Marty, hit him. Carry shot a vicious straight left to Marty's face. Marty slipped aside, flung the aggressive glove high, then uppercut. The black side rocked to the yelling and the stamping, but Carry did not go down as he should have to such a blow. Indeed, so slightly was he stopped that he was back in a moment, jabbing, hooking, forcing Marty to smother. While the crowd ramped, Dong, Tasker spoke angrily to Marty. You should have dropped him with that uppercut. What's the matter with you? Old man McGann, working with the towel, wheezed. He been too much friend, long dat boy. I been tell him before, it ain't no good. Tasker massaging growled, there's no friends in the ring. It was in fact the very rivalry into which they had been pressed to make a champion for the district that had brought Marty McGann and Gordon Carey together. It was a curiously dignified friendship for a pair so young. They were, <clears throat> they were both 18. They would stroll together through the township, drop in at Khan's Cafe, solemnly discussing the latest in boxing as reported in the Metropolitan Press. They lent each other sporting papers and romantic novels dealing with the noble art. Occasionally they went to Tasker's Billiards Saloon and played a game together ignoring the admiring mob that invariably clustered round them there. Once Carey took Marty home to tea and introduced him to his mother and sister, it was the first white home Marty had been in. It was a poor enough place because old Carey was only a fireman at the timber mill, but it was a palace compared with what Marty came out of. The Careys had treated him very nicely. Now attending Marty there in his corner, 
Tasker added to what he had just said. Don't forget, this is your big chance, son. Don't go losing it being silly. Old McGann said, you got a win, boy. You got a, for us, lots, Morris, Dong, round four. Both leapt into the fray to mix it with such vigor that the crowd were brought yelling to their feet. Into him, carry. Come on, Murray. Ah, got him. Yakarel. Back and forth, retreat, advance, to jaw, to body, parry, and block, and lead, and cross, straight left, right hook, jab, and uppercut, carry, you butte, Marty, our boy, Marty, oh, ah, dong. Old man McGann grabbed Marty as he came in, hugged him, wheezing, good on ya, boy, good on ya. While Marty lay back panting, Tasker working him, muttered, You got him, son. You can't stand that pressure. He's starting to swing. Another half minute, you'd a had him. Get stuck right into him this time. He won't last half a round. Finish him off. Still, Marty grinned. Dong. Fifth round. Again, they went at it full pelt, while the mob bellowed and shrieked and made thunder leaping on their seats. Come on, Kerry. Come on, Murray. Stand up to him. You got him. Oh, ah, uh, yakarel. Kerry was fighting desperately, swinging wildly, staggering to the jabs to the body he took every time. Marty ducked his flying arm. His face was white and twisted. Kill him, Marty. Kerry took a straight left to the mouth that tore out his mouth guard so that it dangled down his chin. He staggered back to the ropes, gasping, goggling. He's done, Marty. Finish him off, Murray. Carey was trying to push the mouth guard back into place with his gloved hand, defending himself with single arm cover, but defending unnecessarily because Marty held off. Then Carey spat out the guard and came stumbling to attack, he swung wildly with his right. Marty knocked up the swinging arm, crouched, as if to deliver the knockout, but just hung there. The black crowd screamed its disapproval. Hit him, Murray. Drop him. Carey came back, swinging with the left. Again, Marty flung up the blow, blow. This time, stepped aside, but Carey was recovered. Now, he turned smartly shot out his right, caught Murray in the midriff. Marty staggered. Carey hit him in the neck. Marty sank to his knees. The crowd gasped. Oh. The referee leapt between the contestants, began counting over drooping Marty. One, two, three, four, five. Marty was rising. The referee stepped aside. Carey leapt in, brought his left up under Marty's unguarded chin. Oh, Marty crumpled in a heap, with the referee counting over him. Seven, eight, nine, out. Ya, yeah, boo, carry, good on you, Gordon. Chucked the fight away. Hooray, boo. Carry lent a hand to help Marty to the corner. Marty looked yellow as soap now. But opening his eyes to find Carey's hand patting him, he grinned again. As Carey withdrew, the referee seized him and took that hand of his and raised it in triumph. The whites roared and whistled and stamped. The Murrays were silent. There was silence also in Marty's corner. Marty outside the ring with the others grinned through the presentation of the trophy to Carey and hugged Carey on the way to the dressing room and fondled the trophy. The boys had their best clothes with them because Tom Tasker was giving a party at his pub. Marty's outfit was blue-gray terraline strides, green striped yellow nylon shirt, a green tie with a picture of Joe Louis, 
The boys traveled the little distance into the neon-lit center of the town, sitting together in the back of Tasker's big car. Only Carrie spoke. It was a great fight, Marty. After a while, he added, You nearly had me, mate. Marty only grinned. They alighted at Tasker's, went through the bright hall to the dining room at the rear. A crowd was already there, milling about the tables, on which were jugs of beer and piles of food. The boys were hailed. Carey was mobbed to have his hand pumped and his back pounded. Someone took his trophy and put it in a proud place on the central table. Others brought beer. Marty and Carrie raised their glasses to each other. Good luck. Then somehow Marty was shouldered away from Carrie and left grinning at no one in particular. Tasker, carrying a jug of beer, thus found him, filled his glass for him, and raised his own to him, saying, Good luck. Tasker stood for a moment silent, staring at the crowd, then looking at Marty, he said, Well, son, you chucked away your big chance. Marty dropped his dark eyes to the patent leather shoe with which he kicked against a table leg. Tasker went on, with an edge of anger to his tone. It couldn't have been a worse chuck away if you'd have laid down. Kicking, Marty muttered, Ah, I only was giving him a go. I didn't reckon he had a punch left in him. Tasker sighed. You give it away, son. You give it away. I ain't happy about it either. I put a lot of time into bringing you up. Marty swigged off his beer and shoved the glass towards Tasker. They drank together again. Then Marty asked, What you reckon I better do now, Tom? Better do bout what? Bout fightin' Reckon if I go down south. No good, son. You ain't got what it takes. A. You reckon I's first class. I didn't know you properly, son. You'll never be a fighter, given the other bloke a go. Marty concentrated on his shoe again. Tasker said, Ah, well, better be seeing to my guests. Marty stood for a while, sipping his beer, watching the milling mob, eyeing the trophy, grinning. Then he set his glass down and moved to the door that led to the back veranda and stood out there for some minutes, looking at the starry sky. At length, he stepped off the veranda and made his way across the dark yard, went out by the back gate. He went through the residential part of the town to the road leading out to that other part unofficially called Boongville away beyond the limit of the lights. Boongville suddenly revealed itself with a few dim points of light. Then, with an uproar of dogs, Marty made his way through the darkness to a glimmer that eventually became a hurricane lamp. The lamp stood on a bush table in a dark, in a bark lean-to that served as kitchen and dining room to a sprawling hovel built of bark and rusty iron. The table, though clean, was swarming with red meat ants. As he entered, a barefoot woman came from somewhere within, a lean, half-caste woman, mahogany-skinned, as the breed becomes with age, with scraggy gray hair and eyes so deeply sunken that only a glint betrayed them. She said, Lo, Marty, you... Come early. Lo, mama. She studied him for a moment. You got beat, eh? He answered casually enough. Yeah. She moved to the ant bed fireplace, saying, More better, too. That fightin' business no good. You like em drink a tea. No more, mama. Go in a bed. A couple of hours later, as he lay in sleeping shorts in his sacking bunk, he was roused by voices. A moment later, several half-caste men burst in upon him, 
foremost of them, his massive father, who was waving a lantern and vociferating drunkenly in that wheezy voice. There you are, blurry dingo. Marty jumped up. His father reeled before him, letting all us Murrays down, letting white bucker win. Come outside, I give um you give given that fight away. Marty shoved him off, muttering, Let me alone. Doing me do on you. Ere somebody take him this lamp, I go and abelt him. The man who took the lamp got in between them, pushed old man McGann onto the bunk, then shoving Marty through the rest of the gathering said to him, Go for ye life, Marty. Marty had had to do the disappearing trick often. He slipped out and away from the humpy. Now it was palely light outside with the late moons rising. He went down to the creek and amidst the granite boulders found a patch of silky sand. With a sigh he lay down. Somewhere away in the timber standing ragged against the humpbacked moon, an owl was calling, Mopoke, Mopoke. In the early morning, Marty came back home. The adult males were then dead to the world, with no reason for early rising, since it was Saturday. He had breakfast with the kids, ignoring their questions about the fight. Later, when he heard the men stirring, he slipped out again, back to the creek, but this time to follow it down to the river. He spent the day by the river. He swam, dived for cockles, caught yabbies, and had a meal cooked blackfellow fashion in the coals. He slept a little, but mostly he just sat staring at the sliding water, his bruised chin cupped in a slender copper-colored hand, his deep eyes brooding. He came home stealthily in the red evening. His father's wheeze could be heard raised in disputation in a distant humpy. He went into his own place and sat while his mother got him a meal. His mother asked him if he were going out again. He said he would take a stroll in for a game of billiards. He went into town and to Tasker's. The billiard saloon was crowded. Carrie was there playing pen pool. The usual crowd of admirers were there. They all hailed Marty. He responded with his grin and came up to stand beside Carrie. But whereas the admirers had always fawned as much on Marty <clears throat> as on Carrie, now they forgot Marty and concentrated on Carrie, whom they were calling Champ. Marty's grin slowly faded, and gradually he retreated from the billiard table to sit at last on the high bench against the wall. The pool game dragged through. Carey won it, and rising from the winning shot, shook his golden head like a proud young colt and turned his happy grin on the lesser ones about him. Marty, sitting chin in hand, met the grin stonily, but as Carey turned away to put his cue up in the rack, Mar <clears throat> Marty's face suddenly jerked in the aboriginal way that betrays deep emotion. Carrie turned to leave the saloon. Marty leapt off the bench and came after him, muttering, A, hey, wait a minute. Carrie halted, with blue eyes widening at sight of the quivering dark face. Was wrong. Marty's voice was strangled. What about you and me having another go? Carrie paled. He asked thickly, What you mean, another go? You never been beat me, Dinkum, last night, Carrie. Carrie swallowed, said deliberately, Says who? Says me. 
Carrie's lips thinned in a slight sneer. The ref's decision will do, me mate. Marty struggled to answer that. Carrie turned away. Marty grabbed his arm. Wait on. Carrie jerked himself free, hissing. I got an appointment. Marty slipped in front of him. You got appointment with me first. Carrie snapped. Talk sense. He tried to pass. Marty grabbed him again. Carrie swung on him with fist up. Up came Marty's fist. Okay, you want it bare mitts. But Carrie dropped his hands. I can't go brawling. I'll get disqualified. I'll disqualify you, Carrie. Come and put the gloves on. I told you I got an appointment, Marty. You mean you ain't game for another go. I mean I got no time to argue the toss now. I'll see you about another go later. Carrie turned from him. Marty grabbed his shoulder, spun him round, hissing. You won't put him up. Well, cop this. He slapped Carrie's face. Up came Carrie's fist. Marty's left shot out, caught Carrie under the ear. Carrie staggered, came back swinging his right. Marty ducked under it and slammed his own right into Carrie's ribs. And as Carrie went off balance, leapt in and uppercut him. Carrie staggered back to the table. Marty went after him, hammering Carrie smothered. Then Tasker and others came running in from the adjoining bar, Tasker roaring, A, hey, break it up. Tasker grabbed Marty's shoulder. Marty swung on him, hit him under the ear, sent him sprawling. Carrie came out of his smother as Marty turned, aimed a rabbit punch. But Marty saw it out of the corner of his eye, ducked, pivoted, came up to sledgehammer Carrie in the solar plexus, and, as Carrie went at the knees, brought his left crashing under his chin. Carrie toppled backwards, fell heavily, striking his head on the concrete step below the wall bench. Crack! Carrie lay still while Marty stood over him panting, and the crowd pressed round, goggling. Then there was a clatter of hastening steps, and a powerful voice demanded, What's going on here? A policeman pushed through the crowd, looked at Carrie, then at Marty, asking, What's this? A grudge from last night. A snore broke from Carrie, and from his gaping mouth, a bloody bubble burst. The policeman bent to examine him. Blood was now oozing from the golden hair. The policeman said, This boy's hurt bad. Someone call the ambulance. There was a sudden movement towards the exit. Marty moved to join it. The policeman leapt up and laid a hand on his shoulder. Where are you going? With face jerking again, Marty muttered, Off of me. Well, just stick around here. Marty pulled away from the restraining hand, panting, Let me go. I ain't done nothing. It was fair fight. The policeman took hold of him again and pushed him to the wall bench, growling, Just you stay quiet, boy. Looks like you're in enough trouble as it is. An eagle called Ned Kelly. The district, as far as the telephone lines reached, out from the McClintockville Exchange, was agog with the news that the eagle called Ned Kelly had been seen again, even though it was only the true blue squatters who were really concerned with the big things the news portended. Everybody was interested, the common herd, townspeople, station hands, selectors. However, it was only the blue bloods who had the leisure to come racing <clears throat> in their smart cars in response to the news. Only they who were privileged to congregate 
at the Grazier's Club in McClintockville for a grandstand view of the promised event. Still, everybody else, while they went about their plebeian business that day, had an eye and an ear cocked to the brassy sky and ear as well as an eye for the reason that the squatters, champions, the boys who would be meeting the redoubtable Ned Kelly to dispute the kingdom of the air over their domains would be flying aeroplanes. Ned Kelly had been seen the day before on Yakamunga Station, no doubt about his identity. His mode of depredation betrayed him. Anyway, he was the only wedge tail left in the locality. He had killed a hoggett and gobbled what he wanted of it on the spot. Usually his kind would snatch a lamb and take it away for devouring at ease. Away into the timber beyond the downs or back to the ranges. In those wide clear skies an eagle could be spotted at up to ten miles, not that this had been of any advantage until recently, for even a bird that stayed to gorge on the spot would have made a good meal before the fastest car could get anywhere near him, traveling over the devil-devil country of the Downs, but it was altogether different since the squatters had taken to the air. Only this bird, whose defiance had earned him the name of the famous outlaw, remained in the district, and even he mostly kept away from the stations. That it was sheer defiance <clears throat> that brought him back was certain. There was plenty in the way of forage for his like, in the wild country beyond the ranges, but no more than a sheep's liver to be had here now, and that at the cost of a fight for his life, with enemies ten times his size, and <clears throat> twi <clears throat> twice or thrice his speed, and the ability to strike without giving him a chance to retaliate. At least once he had come so close to falling to the squatter's guns that the red-brown feathers had been seen to fly from him. Well, he had got more than a liver this last time. He had been allowed to feast at leisure yesterday at Yakamunga in order to have him back again today, when the strategy so carefully worked out to deal with him once and for all would be put into operation. His habits were so well known that his enemies were absolutely certain he would be back. They even knew what time it would be, <clears throat> round about noon, when, without effort, he might ride the thermal currents up out of the ranges and at height decide his point of strike and effortlessly maneuver for it. His habits had been the preoccupation of the local gentry. For weeks past, the squatters of McClintockville had taken to the air like most of their class whose overdrafts would stretch to add an aeroplane and a pilot's license to their other distinctions. It might be said that the squatocracy take to the air like ducks to water, but that would be misleading, for whereas it is in the nature of ducks to swim, and in the nature of some men even to fly, what sends the squatter in the sky is the same impulse that mounts him on his thoroughbred that puts him behind the wheel of the smartest car, 
that causes him to parade wherever he may be in wide hat and riding boots. It is the aristocrat's need to proclaim distinction not otherwise apparent, flying to the natural airman, like sailoring to the true-born seaman is a vacation. But to the squatter, it is simply one of the accomplishments appropriate to his social status, a done thing, like racing a thoroughbred horse, just as the horse was in the past an essential part of his nightly sports, his racing, polo playing, hunting, nowadays, it is that mount of all mounts for a man, the aeroplane. It was inevitable that the aeroplane should replace the horse as the squatter's mount for hunting for the squatocratic shoot, which has been one of the favorite social diversions of the class ever since the days when the quarry could be the pesky blacks on whose tribal territory the dynasties of today were being founded. It was also inevitable that the ease with which large earthbound creatures like kangaroos, emus, broglus, brumbies, could be slaughtered from the sky should cause these sportsmen to yearn for quarry more worthy of their greater prowess. They found what they wanted in that great bird, largest of all eagles, the Australian wedge tail. There is now no done thing in the doings of squatterdom half so classy as an eagle shoot. The eagle is the airman's symbol of the <clears throat> that mystery he calls the three-dimensional freedom of the air. By this token, could a true-born aeronaut take joy in the destruction of an eagle? If the answer is no, it goes to show how far from being truly of the vocation were the flying squatters of McClintockville when they had reduced the number of wedge tails habitually frequenting the district from some half score to this single bird they were now hellbent on eliminating. Not that the devastation they had wrought had been easy. Indeed, it had taken months of patient, intelligent, and courageous endeavor to best an eagle with an aeroplane means much more than just charging after him with a gun, no matter how clever a pilot may be in handling his aircraft. An eagle who has wakened up to the fact that he is being hunted will outsmart him with maneuverability. The only way to beat an eagle is to discover his limitations in flight and exploit them. Every flying thing has its ceiling, which is to say its maximum attainable altitude. That of a wedge-tail eagle is about 5,000 feet. A peculiarity of the species is that when harassed, it will not descend below a thousand feet, a circumstance probably due to the fact that the bird's evas evasive tactics are dependent largely on steep diving and subsequent swift climbing that for so large a creature is possible only with the aid of thermal currents. It is not unlikely that such birds can even see the thermals. It is the disposition of the species to avoid combat. Wedge tails will suffer even the indignity of assault by belligerent midgets like magpies, peewees, without retaliating. Even their vying with each other seems to be a matter of proving superiority in the medium where they have no other peers, rather than of doing violence. 
but eagles can be rattled. It was on this fact that the successful strategy of the flying boys of McClintockville was based. Press an eagle hard enough and long enough and he will turn nasty. The turn is literal, a stall turn out of which the bird will come hurtling back to strike. That is the moment for shooting, the great moment of an eagle shoot. To muff it is to risk fatality. The eagle's instinct tells him that he can knock out of the sky anything that flies, nor is his instinct so far out even in respect to aeroplanes. Not a few aerial eagle hunters have come to grief through con collision with the quarry. There had been a couple of near things at McClintockville, one with the redoubtable Ned Kelly. Like the rest of his brethren, Ned had turned, but had the luck to be only peppered by the shot, while sufficiently balked in his intended strike to save all concerned from pretty certain death. He had come hurtling back at the perspex windshield, but out of control, so that he hit the curved surface only a glancing blow, and went tumbling in very unkingly indignity over the tail plane into the burbling wake. The boys had suffered too big a fright to follow up their advantage, and likewise Ned Kelly ever to let them get such an advantage again. An eagle scores over an aeroplane in the same way as those small birds, magpies, peewees, and the like, that have the temerity to vie with eagles, score over their giant rivals. The principle is, the bigger the flying object, the more difficult its maneuvering. The aeroplane's easy hundred knots of more air speed against the eagle's fifty or so, <clears throat> so maximum in level flight gets the aeroplane nowhere when all the eagle has to do to change his height and heading is to retract his wings and drop, then spread his wings again and go shooting away to find a thermal to ride aloft again while resting for the next bout. He could be the best part of a mile away before his outsize opponent has turned around. Even with numerous aircraft in pursuit, the strategy depended on harassing the eagle to the point where he was driven to attack. The McClintockville aeronauts used all four of their aircraft flying in pairs at different levels the lower pair well behind the other and further apart. According to their experience, it took between 20 and 30 minutes of continual harassment to rattle the quarry. They had become so smart at the game that they could even anticipate the crucial moment well ahead through observation of the bird's behavior. The fact that a bird got rattled at a certain point did not mean that that point was the limit of its physical endurance that was surely demonstrated by Ned Kelly's capacity to hang on till the hunters themselves were rattled. It was not unlikely that he also had become so smart at the game that he could judge how it was going from his opponent's behavior. Forty-five minutes of it was about all the boys could take. With them, too, it was not a matter of capacity to keep going, but of loss of precision through strain, as it must have been in the case of the eagles. The boys found they became scared after that time, scared not of their quarry but of each other, as if he knew all about it, 
Ned Kelly when the enemy broke off of the contest instead of making good his escape back to the ranges the moment he got the chance, as in earlier encounters had come to hanging about, circling wild, widely, watching the unjumped earthlings returning to their true medium to shed their assumed wings to creep back into that white-roofed burrow of theirs. But what Ned Kelly would not know, for all his smartness, was how hardly men take defeat down there in the Grazier's Club, swilling their beer. The flying squatters swore to have him hanging, crucified on the wall of the bar, if it was the last thing they ever did. It was about a month since the last encounter, a month of intense activity on the part of the McClintockville boys in preparation for the next. Obviously, what they must do to win was to use a quicker method of turning. They could never hope to change direction in a flash like their pesky rival, but the less time lost in turns, the more could be given to harrying him. They were convinced that with a bit more pressure they would rattle him again, enough to cause him to make the fatal turn on the offensive. The quickest way to turn an aircraft is by means of the wing over, in which the machine is suddenly put up or down, as if to go into a tight loop, but as it is about to become inverted, is rolled so as to be brought right side up again, now flying in the opposite direction. But such a maneuver comes under the heading of aerobatics, for which the machine must be specially stressed, as the term is, if it is to come out of it in one piece. Modern utilitarian aircraft, like those sleek, slick things the McClintockville squatters flew, are not built for aerobatics. Still, margins of safety are always made wider than need be, and you really don't know what a machine of any sort will do till you've been game enough to try it for yourself. The McClintockville boys were nothing if not game. That does not mean they were rash. They began warily, and after putting each plane through a wing over, had them all inspected by an aircraft engineer. The engineer shook his head over the departure from the rules of handling, but could find no sign of strain. Eventually, they were doing wing overs in formation so that it was a joy to see. So they had been saying for a week past, let Ned Kelly come. Well, he was coming now, in the heat of the day, riding the thermals up out of the western ranges, according to that telephone call which had brought the gentry racing in their fine cars to the club. The aircraft were already out of the hangar, beautifully shiny things, more than machines. There were four of them, two low-winged, two high-winged, in brilliant colors, crimson and silver, French gray and electric blue, silver and emerald, scarlet and jet. The crews, four men to each, Two gunmen to each were conferring, taking their briefing from the flight leader, a tall, carroty young man. Half the crowd were milling round the aeroplanes. The rest were back out of the heat on the wide veranda of the clubhouse, where beer was being served by a white-coated flunky. The 
aerodrome was actually the space enclosed by the club's race course over which two runways ran to form an oblique cross. Distance was lost in mirage. Someone scanning the western sky through binoculars shouted, There he is! All looked in the direction indicated. Voices rose. The press about the aeroplanes scrambled clear, and the crews clambered aboard. The engines stuttered into life, roared smoothly. The gray dust and the bleached grass flew. The planes began to roll towards the runway. The low-winged red and silver machine in the lead, its pilots, the carroty young man, busy now on his radio, leaving the handling to the co-pilot at his side. The gunmen <clears throat> were seated in the rear. The leader halted on the threshold of the runway, well to the right. The others halted back a bit and out of line with the leader. The leader stood on his brakes, roaring and quivering in the run-up. Thirty seconds, then the leader was away, racing up the runway to leap into the air, to climb, lurching into the turbulence, boiling up from the baking earth. Thirty seconds behind the leader went number two, then three, then four. When soon they formed up, it was an one-sided stepped echelon, which is to say strung out to the left of the leader and back and down, so that each was some hundred feet out from the line of flight from the man next to him and the same distance behind and below. Rapidly, they overhauled what had appeared as a mere dot in the sky to begin with, Ned Kelly seeming to stand there suspended at about 4,000 feet, but actually, as seen through binoculars, moving widely, with no more effort, apparently, than an occasional flick of ruddering, wedge-shaped tail, or of primary feathers extended from wing tips, like the fingers of delicate hands. He was certainly a big fellow, ten feet at least from tip to tip, of those great wings spread locked by their own marvelous mechanism, for that effortless type of flight. His head, with its Cruel, cruel beak lolled from side to side like a questing serpent's. His russet plumage flashed golden highlights to the dip and roll of his riding the invisible stream. He was watching the approaching flight of aircraft, apparently as little concerned about them as he would have been about a flight of other birds. He allowed the leader to come to what, perhaps, in his knowledgeability, he reckoned was about the range of the guns that were already poking out of the rear windows, a hundred feet or so. Then suddenly he was just a brown bundle falling out of the sky. He dropped straight down about two hundred feet when well out of range of any one of the aircraft, he spread his great wings and went gliding away at terrific speed, zigzagging, looking for the thermal to take him aloft again. It was the same old thing, but this time the enemy acted differently as the eagle bundled himself and dropped the carroty leader microphone in hand, called to his flight, wing over. In unison, they dropped their noses to come up in a flash, at full bore, up up, till they were vertical, falling on their backs. When they rolled outwards, and there they were, roaring away, down after Ned Kelly. He saw them as he caught the thermal, and went spiraling up on locked wings, 
and betrayed the shock of finding them so close with the sudden unlocking of his wings to give a few wild flaps. The carroty captain laughed, shouted to his crew, got him rattled already before Ned Kelly had regained half of the five or six hundred feet of height he had given away, they were on him again. He bundled and dropped. The call went out, wing over. This time, as the eagle sped down the sky, down, 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 giving away a thousand feet or more, he kept looking back at his pursuers. Scarcely had he found his thermal when they were catching up with him again. He flapped hard, swung up into the attitude from which to make a stall turn. The captain swung his plane to starboard, shouting, Port gun! But Ned Kelly rolled into a wing over of his own, and, as he did so, bundled himself and went hurtling down. Wing over, the captain added into his microphone, as the formation came round to go rushing down in pursuit. We'll get him this time for sure. Down a long, long declivity, the eagle went, down almost to his limit of a thousand feet from the ground, but that his, attention, his intention was not simply to get away from the enemy as far and as fast as possible was soon evident. Even his comparatively pur purblind rivals must have seen the rising dust and if not, could not help but note the speed of roughness of his ascent, for it was no mere thermal he had sought and found, but a young willy-willy. Perhaps the boys saw, but were too eagerly anticipating, the next contact to give any thought to the situation. Such was his ascent that he regained some fifteen hundred feet before he was assailed again, then, as if he knew the score, he waited, holding his level with sudden little steep gliding turns, till the leader was rocking with him in the turbulence. Then he bundled and went down. The carroty captain swore as he fought to keep the aircraft level and handle the mic. There was exasperation in his voice as he called, wing over. He pulled her up, back over, crack. The captain shouted, what was that? Someone yelled, look at the wing. The port wing was sticking up oddly. All eyes swung to the starboard for comparison, swung back to see it leap up and come crumpling over the cabin, like an enfolding hand. The plane rolled over to port, went hurtling as if inevitably down and back towards the next information, while both crews goggled helpless, crunch, wheels smashing into fuselage, frightful din of propellers locking and tearing to pieces, of freed engines howling, Whoosh! The fiery mass rolled over and over as it fell, Ned Kelly watching as he went, wheeling down the sky. Saw it hit the earth, saw the dust cloud rise, billowing, flickering with fire to become an up-whirling thermal he might have used had he been near enough. Wheeling, he watched the wild rush of the earthlings in their cars, watched the remnants of those who had presumed to dispute his kingdom go back to where they belonged. Then, catching a thermal, he went back aloft. Now he was watching the sheep. He headed towards a group of stragglers, wheeled over them chose the one he wanted, dropped down to 1,500 feet, slowly. Then he retracted his wings to mere hand spans, 
with primaries working his balance like dainty fingers went hurtling down in a steep dive. The small flock heard the whistling of his wings as he extended them to break his dive. They scattered, blaring. Too late, he hit his hogget with the bony knuckle of his wing, sent it tumbling. The momentum carried him up. He, he stall turned, dropped to the ground beside his victim, lying with glazing eyes, blood leaking over its lolling tongue. He stood awkwardly on pantalooned legs, swaying to the weight of his drooping wings, his great beak gaping, his breast heaving, a travesty of the monarch of the air. The other sheep were bunched at a distance. Behind them, the horizon rolled in the mirage like a stormy sea in which the smudge of the smoke of the burning looked like a flat-topped island. Leisurely, Ned Kelly set about his meal.